Um, I want to start uh, the message this morning just by talking again that culture is changing. And for many people, it's changing so quickly that uh, you, you almost feel like you're all, you know, worked up and, 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 and just and how things are changing from what you're comfortable with. And for some people, somebody would say, praise the Lord, culture is changing. Amen. Um, we live in a culture of death. We live in a culture of, of unforgiveness. We live in a culture of disorder. We live in a culture of incredible sin and the operation. And we shouldn't be surprised of that. Isn't that what Jesus came to rescue us from when he died on the cross? Was more than just forgive us of our sins. He came to give us life and abundant life. And that's what we get the privilege of living in. And, and when you move from the kingdom of the world to the kingdom or the kingdom of death to a kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of life, there's also culture shock that takes place. It is way different than what we were raised in or what we were brought up in. It, and the culture in the kingdom of God is completely different. Uh, than the culture of the world. And one of the things I want to talk about today is this idea of the culture of unity. Now, um, all of us, we want unity as long as everyone else sacrifices to agree with me. That's funny. Uh, so I'm wondering if you're laughing right or you're listening right now, but that is funny. Look at this. Um, uh, we want unity as long as I don't have to sacrifice, adapt, compromise, or accept something I don't like. Other than that, I love unity. Right? But, but I don't want unity if I have to sacrifice, if I got to change, if I got to, you know, agree with someone else or maybe move to the, the middle with them or just accept something that I don't like. I'm not going to, I don't want unity that badly. And I can tell you that we're giving all kind of platforms in order to destroy unity among the body of Christ. Isn't it true? Uh, the world, because we, we really do live with one foot in the world and one foot uh, in the kingdom of heaven. God's saying, I want you to step into the kingdom of heaven, all of you, in the kingdom of heaven. I want you to walk through this world from the culture and perspective of the kingdom of heaven Jesus did not walk according to the culture of the world. He walked in the world. He went through the world, but he wasn't of the world. Amen? He, was, he says, I'm of another place, and so are you. And so I want to talk about this a little bit closer today. And, and I know, um, you know, this is one where you may have disunity in your marriage. You may have disunity in your family. You may have disunity in your workplace or your neighborhood, you know, because your neighbor is cutting one row over onto your lawn at a lower height than you like to mow your lawn. And so now you don't really care for your neighbor all that much. And there's some discord because of the mowing patterns and habits of your neighbor. Right? How many know about people like that? They don't value unity they don't put unity in a place where they say, this is a very important thing in my life. I want to show you why the word of God says that unity should be a constant thought in every relationship that we have. Because the word shows us this. John 10.10 10 says this. The thief devil comes only to what? And what? And I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. It's a different culture, a culture of life. In a culture of life, there is a value of unity. And, and I want to talk about that. The culture of death divides people, creates tension among people, diminishes people. It, it really does not value people. Where a culture of life lifts people up. It brings people together, not because we all agree with one another. There's a, you don't need to agree with everyone to be in unity. I think somewhere along the line, we've lost that. We've, we, we rarely see that demonstrated where we say we just don't agree with each other, but we love one another. There's unity that binds us together. Matthew 12, 25 says this. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, 
every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Every church that is divided against itself will fall apart. And every home that's divided against itself will fall apart. And every nation that's divided against itself is going to fall and every workplace that's divided against itself is going to fail. It's a principle in the Word of God that is true. Psalms 133.1 says this, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. There was another version of this that says that maybe you're familiar with. Go back to, to that verse. Another version, go back to the last verse. Uh, how good and pleasant it is for God's people to dwell together in unity. How many have heard that version? And, and when we dwell together, the great thing, the, that dwelling, when we dwell in unity, how many know that it's a happier home? Right? When you dwell in unity, it's a happy, happier workplace. In fact, when most people say that my workplace is toxic, what they're saying is there's no unity in our workplace. I don't feel unified. I feel disconnected or mistreated or disunified from those around me. And it says, uni and, and the reality is, unity is not an accident. If you're going to have unity, it's going to require intentionality. It's going to require you to work to breed unity in the place. Well, why? And this is the thing. I, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but I see this in marriages a lot. Um, I'll, I'll hear people say, yeah, I'm the only one trying to bring unity in the workplace. How many have heard that? How many have actually said that? Your mask doesn't actually keep you from raising your hand every now and then or saying amen. So it's always good to say amen from time to time to know you still got a voice that your mask can't keep that away from you, right? Okay, so, so, a lot of times, I'm always the one doing it. How many know that we always think we're doing it more than we actually are, and we never think the other person is doing it as much as they are? You know what that's called? Marriage. It's true. We do it in marriage. We do it in every part of our life. We overshoot what we're actually doing. We say, I'm praying all the time. Well, okay, have you ever tried measuring that statement? Have you ever said, yeah, I'm praying all the time. Let me write down every time I'm praying it. I think what you'll discover, it's not quite as much as you think it is. Right? So unity becomes part of our culture and it's what God does in us. So when Christ comes in us, there is a force in us that becomes naturally, naturally intentional about bringing unity. Like when, when we're people of the kingdom of God, what we're trying to do when we see other people is literally to love them. And when you love somebody, you want unity with them. Right? And so there are times where you don't get into battles that you don't need to get into because it's, it's not going to bring unity. There is a season to discuss something, but to do it in a unified way. If you try to discuss something when it's a disunified in environment, you will not accomplish anything. In fact, it will make it worse. How many recognize that? It goes on, and this is what it says in Psalms 33, 3. It goes, it says, for there the Lord bestows or commands his blessing, even life forevermore. That when there is unity, God commands blessing into that environment. He bestows, or a better word we would use is commands blessing. I, I want you to just think about that for a moment. When God commands something, how many believe it happens? Right? So he commands blessing into environments of unity where there is unity. You don't have to agree. You know, it's amazing uh, if you've, I don't know about you, but um, I've always enjoyed when we go to the fair, um, 
watching the Belgium horses when they come by. We'll go into the horse barn, and we'll go up into the horse barn, and we'll watch the horse. If we do anything in the barn, it's usually to watch horses. And the Belgians are such huge horses, or Clydesdales, uh, whatever. Uh, how many have seen them close up, actually stood up next to them? They're just enormous beasts. I don't know that you call it a horse other than it looks like it, but it's a beast. I mean, they're big. And, and one of the things that you'll see if you go to the fair is they'll do horse pulls. And, uh, and I've only been to one in the, main, in the main arena at Minnesota Fair. I got to see a little bit of it. Um, but they'll have the Belgians come out, a Belgium come out, and then they pull a weighted sled, and then they put all this weight on it, and then that's how they find out who the strongest Belgium is, and there's an award, you know, the blue ribbon and everything. And, and, uh, but it's an interesting thing about a Belgium. An average Belgium horse can pull about 8,000 pounds. Now, you didn't know that until today, so you learned something already, right? Unless you're a horse person. But if you take... Two Belgium horses that don't know each other, one's from Minnesota, one's from Iowa, and you put them together, uh, just by putting them together, two Belgiums will pull uh, 24,000 pounds. They don't, even, they don't even know each other. You just put them together. They, you don't know if they like each other. You don't know, but they're, they're working together. Two Belgiums won't pull 16. They'll pull 24,000 pounds. But what what... People, and this is an interesting thing, if you have two Belgiums that have grown up together, they're best friends, they probably have known each other since they were very young, they call those Belgiums, and maybe you've heard this term, a matched pair. How many have heard that before? If you know animals, it's called a matched pair. They've been together for a long time. They, they know each other. They know how each other works. They... They're in unity with one another, and you put them together, and you put two Belgians, a matched pair together. Do you know that they will pull 32,000 pounds? Isn't that incredible? 8,000 pounds more because they get along. Imagine a matched pair in marriage. Imagine what a matched pair in marriage could pull and do in the kingdom of God. It is incredible what happens when we dwell together in unity. But unity doesn't just happen. In fact, if you don't intentionally want or desire unity in your marriage, if you don't understand that in the kingdom of God, we are people who unify. We reconcile. We, we live in unity. That's what God's calling us. That is God's will, which means that is God's desire, that we live in unity. God is working for your unity. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? How do you know God is working for my unity? I'm glad you asked, actually, because I actually have some verses that re 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 kind of point to this. And John, look at this. Three times, Jesus said he was praying and, and was praying for you to be unified. He says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that, say this with me, they may be one as we are. Now, how many say the Trinity is probably pretty unified? Right? I would think they're probably pretty unified. But he's not done there. Jesus is praying this. Now, I can pray for you, and it's powerful and effective. You could pray for someone, and it's powerful and effective. But right now, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father praying for you to be one. He is asking the Father to work on your behalf in situations where you need unity. I'm just letting the Holy Spirit talk to you right now. I hope you're hearing them. Because you got an axe to grind with somebody and you think you got your rights. Aren't you glad God didn't grind his axe with you? Because you probably wouldn't be here right now. How many are thankful for the unmerited grace of God? 
Do you know how we worship the Lord and thank Him for that? By showing the same unmerited grace to those around us. Right? Look at the next one. Holy, uh, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So he's not just praying for those who lived at that time. He's praying for those who are here in this room today. All of us who believe today. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world, what? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Our unity is a sign to the world that we're not from this place. That no matter what comes against us, we're unified. No matter if a pandemic comes against us, that we don't bigger, bicker and fight with one another. We don't go on Facebook and attack other believers because we don't agree with them. We don't get all coarse and rude and mean. And we don't let uh, uh, the, 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 the issues with race and all of that to divide us. We allow those things, the things that are evil, all of the evil, the racism, and all of that to push us together, not pull us apart. There should have been a much louder amen to that than that. But we're fighting over masks. No, we're not. Right? I'm prophetically speaking. We're not fighting over masks. Right? It goes on in John 17, says this, I, ha I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity, then the world will know. How will the world know? We're in complete unity. I think it's pretty clear that Christ wanted his bride to get along. I think it's pretty clear that God wanted his bride to be in unity. The church has not lost its power. The message of Christ isn't, is, is not no longer relevant. It's we lost our unity. We have allowed the culture of death to seep into our life that when we come, again, come into church, all we see are the differences among us than who we are in Christ. Is that me or is it getting quieter in here? Isn't that true? That when we come in those doors, one of the things we see, all we see is the differences. We're not seeing that we are the bride of Christ. That we are one in Christ. That we're going to spend an eternity with each other. That we have many things in common. We allow our beliefs of the world in the world to separate us. We allow political beliefs to separate us. We allow the arguments of the world to somehow divide us. And a kingdom divided against itself is going to what? What? So the church is not stumbling because Christ is no longer relevant. The church is not stumbling because there's no longer any power left. The church is stumbling because we have lost our unity with one another. We are more caught up in being right and winning an argument. We're never going to win because it's an argument in the world rather than intentionally bringing unity among ourselves and letting our unity with one another be a sign to the world that there's something greater than arguments in this place. We need to get along. It's a culture of we. I don't know about you, but I have three daughters, and when my daughters were growing up, three, uh, the, the one thing that uh, would just drive us not, nuts was when they would fight with each other. And when they fight now, it's because somebody borrowed their shirt, and somebody borrowed their jeans, and somebody borrowed, and I'm like, oh my goodness, you guys are all guilty. 
right? Yesterday, you took their jeans and then put it back. Last week, you put their shirt. If you ever stopped and just thought about how silly some of that is, and most of the stuff I bought you anyway, it wasn't yours. We used to tell our kids, we used to tell our kids, you run away, you run away with nothing. You run around naked because everything you have stays. It's all ours. You didn't buy one thing, and then you'll leave naked, and you'll realize maybe I should stay home, <laughs> right? But, but the reality is, is they fight over stupid things. Isn't that true as we get older? And as parents, there is nothing greater uh, than, than when we're sitting there, and we're sitting, and all of our daughters are either getting married or have boyfriends, and we're sitting, and they're all in unity talking with each other, laughing. And how many parents know what I'm talking about? You can sit there, not say a word, and feel like you went into heaven. Right? Why? Because your kids are in unity. I mean, what do you think God feels when he watches his children bicker with each other over things that are not eternal? over things that have distracted them in the world, things that are temporary and pointless and useless. How do you think God's heart hurts for his family? A culture of we. In the kingdom of God, there's a culture of we. I'm sure you've never seen this verse in this manner, but in Joshua 24, it says this, but as for me and my household, we, we, we will serve the Lord. The key word there is we. We have to move from me and mine to we. Because Christianity in many ways has grown into a me and mine religion, which is so demonic. Religion's demonic. This is all about a relationship. I don't know, I don't know how, how much I need to say this, but religion is demonic. It gets you right to, the, right to the border of salvation, and it keeps you from ever walking into it. Jesus didn't come to create another religion. He came to open a way for relationship. Religion says, do this, do this, do this. You don't need relationship if you do all of these things. Christ says, I am the way. I am the relationship that takes you to the Father. Right? So, it's about us. When it ceases to be about me and I and becomes about we, unity will begin to occur. When it stops being about what I need, God, I'm coming to church for what I want, and I want music my way, and I want in my marriage, I want them to do this thing for me. And I when, when in the workplace, it's what I'm getting and how they're treating me and how they're talking to me. And whether they reached out to me when I don't reach out to anyone in my life, I'm never reaching out to people. I come in, though everything should revolve around me, then I'm in the right place because then it's all about me. Literally, in, in our marriage, we want it to be all about me. And, and, and you say, well, I'm not like that. But you're acting like that. Remember in James when I, I had you do this? I said, when you get in a fight, how many remember this? When you get in a fight, because I need you to say this with me. When you get in a fight, this is what I want you to do, okay? In the next fight, you win. I want you to take your finger. Remember, take your finger. I want to point it. I want you to do this. Everyone say this with you. Remember, do you know what the problem is? Okay, ready? We'll do that again. The masks. They're keeping it. You know, you guys say it a little louder. You know, point your finger at me and say, do you know what the problem is? I'm not getting what I want. That's what James says is the problem. There's something I want. I'm not getting it, so I get angry, right? And, and when I get angry, I get offended. And when I get offended, I get upset. And then it begins to destroy the unity that God wants in my life. In Numbers, Moses is, is doing everything. And God says, listen, Moses, this isn't all about you. This is about everyone. This isn't a you thing. This is a we thing. 
This is all about all everyone working together in unity. It's not about one person doing it and everybody else attacking and criticizing why they do it that way. It's about unity. Matthew uh, uh, 6, 9 says, Our Father which art in heaven. He's our Father, not my Father. And I know there's a personal relationship with Christ. I get that. But he's all of our Father, and we're in the same family. That it's about us. We, and we get along. This me and my religion, a religion is is really all about what I'm getting out of, out of it. As long as I'm getting my way, what works for me, what commandments, what must I do to be saved, what must I do to reach heaven, what must I do to be blessed, what must I do to be favored, what must I do to get my marriage back. What, what, you, when you're trying to intentionally bring uh, uh, unity in your, re, in your life and your relationships, you say, Lord, what... What can I do for us? When I pray, we're doing prayer and fasting this week. It's interesting how many people become believers in prayer and fasting when they're going through a difficult time in their life. But when everything is going great, there are a number of people who would say, I'm not, ta- not going to not eat for a week. I'm not going to do that. Do you know prayer and fasting? Prayer and fasting, you know what fasting does? It doesn't make you more righteous. Fasting is a discipline that literally makes you more aware in your faith to believe things that you wouldn't believe when you're not fasting. And I can tell you right now that there are brothers and sisters in Christ in your life that need you to have some clarity for them. The question I have, would I wake up at 6.30 or 7.30, go to a prayer meeting from 6.30 to 7.30, not because I'm needing it necessarily in my life, but there are people in my body that need, need me to be at a place where I can reach out and I can pray and lift them up. That's when we move from a place of it's all about me to we're part of something bigger than me, that this is we. And when a brother and sister is hurting, I'm going to reach out because silver and gold have I none. But what I got, I'm going to give you some of that, and it's going to change your life forever. It's going to, it's going to move some mountains in your life. And me and my life says, I, I want music my way. I want to do church my way. I want things the way I want. I want the preacher to preach what I think he should preach. And and, and if I don't agree with what he's saying, I'm, I'm just going to deny that's even true rather than think about it and let the Holy Spirit. Marriage, she didn't tell me how good I looked. He didn't bring me flowers. You know, it, it's, we, we have allowed so many things in our life to just create a culture in our thinking, right? Um, think about the number of messages we hear. I've said this many times. Uh, Think about how often we open up a door to the culture of the world around us to preach to us messages. You watch, you watch the soap operas in the morning on television. You watch YouTube. They're all preaching a way of thinking. They're all preaching a way of thought that really uh, contradicts a culture of the kingdom of God and a culture of life. It creates disunity. So I want to talk about uh, Romans 12, 15. It, it talks about this kingdom culture is a we culture. Kingdom culture is a we culture. And it says rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's Romans. He says when you rejoice for those who rejoice, you, you rejoice together with them. A unified atmosphere, a unified atmosphere is a blessing to every person who dwells in it. When they come in, when people come into a church or people come into your home or people come into your workplace, it doesn't take long for them to have discernment to know if there's unity in that home or in that workplace. It doesn't take long for them to discover if there's unity. And I'm going to tell you where there is unity, there are people working for it. The Bible says, look at this, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, go to one body in Ephesians 4, 3, 6. 
I want, I want to read this to you, this verse. It's such a powerful verse. Look at this. Make every effort to keep the unity. Now, I know for some, that's a hard word to hear. I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit would just transact that scripture into your heart right now. Say this with me. Make every effort to keep the unity in your marriage, in your workplace, in your church, whatever, with your relationships. Make every effort, he says, of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Make every effort. But we live in a world that is forming categories for everyone. We got political parties, ethnic groups, age groups, religious groups, sexual groups, sexes. Uh, jobs, sports, families, finances. We create groups for we're dividing everyone up and God is saying you're, you're one body, you're one family, you're one creation. You were created by one creator. All of us. We need to be lifting people up, not tearing them down. Now listen, I know it's been a while since we dealt with, we, we really directly talked about this. But I want to make it very clear. Somebody keeps, somebody was just telling me, all lives matter. All lives matter. Listen, no one's debating that. Everyone say this for me so you get it out of your system. All lives matter. But so do black lives. Right? So do black lives. And they haven't been mattering very much. So stop saying something that's really quite, if I can be honest with you, ignorant. And reach down and say, yeah, they matter. Black lives do matter. And, and I want to lift them up because I matter. They should matter. Does that make sense? So we reach down. Every, there, there's a book. I want you to read this book if you haven't. It's called, um, uh, the Third Option by Miles McPherson. Uh, I lost it for some reason. You know, 32, you start losing your memory. Uh, it's called The Third Option by Miles McPherson. I want you to read it. And it really talks about how the body of Christ should be leading the way. Because we're lifters, not leaners. We're lifters, not leaners. We, we need to come together and work for complete unity. We need unity, and we need to be unified in the body of Christ, and we should be an example to the world, but the world is heaving because their culture is a culture of death, and so there is evil in the world, but there is, the world is, there is such a division even among races. Listen, if you're white, you need to invite people who don't look like you over to your home. We need to get to know one another. We need to work for unity. Not just sitting by each other and going, how was your day? Is not a sign of unity. Unity is when we come together in heart. I want to talk about three things quickly. The first one is we have a common enemy. We have an enemy. We share an enemy. We're in unity because we're fighting the same. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting the enemy that's trying to divide us. We have one enemy, one thief. Number two, we need to have one heart. You may not look like the other person. You may not think the way they think. You may not have been brought up the way they were. Maybe you were an adopted child and they were, and you went through the foster system and they were raised in, an, in a typical uh, uh, traditional family and they were brought up. But we need to be one heart. Acts 4.32 says this, all believers were in one heart and in mind. You become one in heart by doing three things. Write these three things down. Here's the first thing you learn. You go into every relationship not thinking you know everything. You go into every relationship wanting to learn from the person that's around you. We need to stop thinking we know everything and we need to be people who come to learn. We come to the table to learn. 
you know, I love to come to the table with my friends and just laugh together, have fun together. I don't, you know, I preach pretty intensely, so you think when I come to a table, I want to have this, like, intense conversation. I'll go there if you want to go there, but that's not what I'm looking forward to. Most of the time, I just want to sit and laugh. I want to interact. I want to have fun. We need, and, and it's incredible what you learn when you're having fun with one another. There are two ways. When you, when you play with each other and when you work with one another, you learn all about that person. Isn't that true? So that means, if you're from Minnesota, how many people from Minnesota? That actually means you have to go to your house, a neighbor's house. That actually means you invite people to your house. You don't drive into your garage, shut the garage door, and then and separate yourself. That actually means you interact with all kinds of people. It means you intentionally plan times for people to come over. You actually clean your house and make a meal so people can come over, right? We're, we're a church of 45 nations. Most of the people from those nations come to America and they're shocked by how we are so closed off from one another. Most of them have never been in the home of an American, a white American, or for that matter, a black American. Because we don't open our doors to people. Unity requires getting to know one another. Is this making sense? And learning. Here's you lament. You don't try to defend yourself. Uh, you don't try to defend yourself. You listen. You cry with one another. You have compassion. And you, you're, when, when someone's going through one, you care. You're there. You feel with them. When you go to a funeral, you don't go into the funeral and, and try to tell them something. Give them words. You just say, because there's no words. You don't know what to say. So you're just like, I'm here if you need me. And you just let people know how much you care by being there. Sometimes in situations, we need to show lament. Galatians 6.2 says this, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need to bear with people. Who are you bearing with today? Who are you bearing with today? The third one is love. We do what we do when we truly love one another. Do we love one another or are we just aware of who they are? 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says this. It always protects. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Here's the last thing we do. We have one purpose. One purpose. We have one purpose. We are the bride of Christ. We are a light and we are salt to the world. That is our purpose. Everything that's happening in the world around us is to get you to be divided against yourself and to stop being the light and salt. Hear me. We have one purpose, and this is our message. To be ministers of reconciliation, to bring people to the saving understanding of who Jesus Christ is. That's our purpose. We have an eternal purpose. One that will last forever and ever and ever. And so there are all kinds of missions and purposes out there. But every mission we are engaged with, you are engaged with as a believer in Christ should always have its end in bringing people to Jesus. Because everything else passes away. But that will never pass away. You, you could redeem the whole world in all of the evils of the world, but without the redemption of the blood of Jesus Christ, it will come to an end. But through Jesus Christ, we live forever. So the church dare not allow the divisions of the world to become the divisions of our culture in this church or in our home or in our workplace. If you have a workplace where you're that, that we should make every effort to bring unity. I want to end on these two thoughts. A kingdom that is unified can do the impossible. Tower of Babel. God said, if we can't stop, they're unified. We can't stop what they want to do. But a divided kingdom cannot even do the possible. 
Divided kingdoms can't even do the easy. That's why the church has stumbled. If we come together, we will see 32,000 pounds of force being unleashed into a dark world. But we got to come together. And where does it start? Not with the person next to you. If your marriage comes together in unity, you will conquer things that you never thought possible. So, Father, right now I pray in the name of Jesus for every person in this room, Lord, that has valid reasons for being upset and angry with someone else who calls himself a believer. Lord, your word says make every effort. So today we need your help because there's some things that I just don't want to put any effort in. I don't want that. I just don't. So, Lord, right now I need you to give me a revelation of how much you love me so that I'm able to operate in that love and make an effort for unity. Lord, I pray, I'm so consumed by principle that it's often robbed me of unity because I'm, it's my principle. This is, what, Lord God, I pray that you would just soften that in me. Lord, that I would be able to stand and say, God, help me to be unified. Help me to speak in words that would unify and lift up our relationship and not tear it down, I pray in the name of Jesus.